So, um, welcome everybody. Um, today we'll be talking um, about group processes. This is chapter 8 in your textbook. Um, so, let's just get going. There we go. Okay, so, um, when we talk about group processes, I guess we should start by defining what do we mean by a group. Uh, so, a group is a set of individuals who have direct interaction with each other over time and have a shared fate, identity, or set of goals. So a group is more than just a, say, a collection of people. Um, there has to be some type of unifying characteristic about the group. Again, either a shared fate, a shared identity, or a shared set of goals. And there needs to be interaction over direct interaction over a prolonged period of time. Um, we can compare groups to what are known as collectives, and in collectives, people are engaging in common activity, but they're having very little or sometimes no direct interaction uh, with one another. So um, let's say as a student body, the SUNY Oneana students, uh, we could think of as a collective, right? We're all engaging in some common activity, but the, the entire student body isn't having direct interaction with each other. Um, so when we talk about groups, um, depending on your culture, um, a, a culture could decide or could help influence what uh, we consider a group or not. So why exactly do people join groups? There, there are lots of reasons. Um, number one, there are plenty of things that we wish to accomplish that we can only do as a group, right? Um, there are plenty of things that as individuals we're not able to do by ourselves, but as a group we can do them. So a big part of, or a big reason why we join a group is to get things done that we normally wouldn't be able to do. Um, going back to chapter 3 of, of this class, talking about the social self, um, we know that humans are incredibly social animals and that we have this innate need to belong. And this is where the social brain hypothesis comes from. Um, essentially, it means that we've evolved to want to, to or we evolved to, to have this need to be part of a group. Um, not just a group, but groups in general, right? Um, there's a lot of say our personality or a lot of our self-concept that is made up of or is entangled in um, the different group identities that we have. Um, belonging to a group also offers us protection from physical threats and from emotional threats, right? Having a group, you know, safety in numbers, definitely when it comes to physical uh, threats, but also having a group to rely on or to fall back on when you're upset or when you have a a um, a blow to your self-esteem, all of these things offer us some some protection. Or these groups offer us protection in, in several different ways, not just physical. Um, okay, so what are some key features of a group? Well, groups will often have designated roles uh, for each of the members. And this group socialization doesn't necessarily have to be explicit, meaning that these roles and rules, norms, that we'll talk about in a minute, don't have to be written down somewhere. Um, they can be implicit, meaning that everyone kind of just knows what they are um, without it being explicitly stated. Um, so roles can be implicit or explicit. They could also be formal or informal. Um, you know, some groups have executive boards, right? There, there are executive directors and secretaries, or presidents, vice presidents, what have you. Um, but even in the absence of, say, formal roles, um, people will start to take on different types of roles within the group. So it could be a more of an informal um, type of role structure. So when we talk about roles, though, 
um, they form, well, they'll fall into one of two categories. Uh, the first is what we would call instrumental role. So instrumental, uh, somebody in an instrumental role, um, their job is to essentially help the group achieve its task, right? Um, help the group reach its goal. So they're, they're serving an instrumental, uh, instrumental purpose. The, they're instrumental into the reaching the end game. Um, also, people might take on an expressive role. And people who are taking on an expressive role um, tend to be the ones who provide emotional support and keep the group together um, by keeping morale high. They're kind of, you know, the 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 glue essentially that that keeps the um, the group working and, and sort of act as peacemakers um, or mediators if need be. So whenever uh, we talk about roles and who's going to take on which role, of course it's beneficial to the group and to the group performance um, to match people to the roles according to their talents and to their personality. Um, so you know you might take on a different role depending on the task or the nature of the group. Okay, so we have roles and we have norms which we can think of as kind of uh, the, the expectations um, or expectations of behaviors. So like roles, norms could either be formal or informal, and they could be explicit or, or implicit. I would say explicit norms are, are kind of like rules, or formal norms would be rules of conduct, um, you know, rules that we're supposed to follow. But a lot of times um, there are unspoken rules, right? We, we kind of just know how to behave or how not to behave uh, within a group. The group will set I its own norms um, that each member is expected to follow. Sometimes those are, you know, very clearly defined and explicitly stated, and other times they're not. Um, so when people deviate from these norms, it could actually threaten um, group member sense of uniformity, and it can actually start uh, um, threatening people's social identity, right? Um, norms are kind of really what makes a, a group operate, or what gives a group its identity, right? These are the rules, these are our customs, this is what we do as a group. Once people stop following those those norms, um, then you're kind of losing, you know, losing the, the glue. You're kind of losing the uh, what it even means to to really be a group, right? You're just becoming individuals or acting as individuals now, um, not following any of the group norms. So norms are incredibly important, and um, you know, as with everything that we talked about this semester thus far and going forward, um, culture plays a, a big part in, say, um, norms and, and how groups form um, different norms or, or the different norms that, that groups will take on. Um, we can think of cultures and norms as, um, or we can think of cultures as falling into, say, two categories when it comes to uh, to social norms. Tight cultures, so tight cultures have very strong norms, very strong, say, rules, um, and they don't tolerate deviation from, from these norms. There's very little tolerance um, for you know, people going their own way, so to speak. Um, when we talk about loose cultures, uh, these are cultures that have relatively weaker norms, and there's a lot more tolerance for for deviation from those norms. Um, so when it comes to you know what's going to make a culture tight or or loose, there are a couple of things that that contribute to um, say which category a particular culture is going to fall into. Um, there are potential ecological and historical threats that may play a role. Um, population density, you know, if you have a 
in a small, tight-knit community, this is probably a tighter culture than, say, like a much bigger city where there's tons of people crammed into a, lot, uh, a small amount of space. Um, you know, it's a lot harder to, to regulate people. Um, and there's a lot more potential for, for deviation or deviating from norms. Also, when it comes to, say, governmental um, restraints, laws, or, or religious um, constraints, right? So depending on um, all of these factors, um, you know, there might be stronger or weaker social norms and either more or less tolerance for um, behaviors that deviate from those norms. If you take a look at um, this graphic here that comes from your test textbook, and um, this is taking a number of different countries here and rating them on a scale in terms of whether they are a tight culture or a loose culture. Um, and in this regard, or in this rating, um, higher numbers means more looseness, right? So we can take a look, let's see, which culture, looks like Luxembourg here. No, there's Belgium at 120. So they look like, excuse me, it looks like Belgium um, has the, the loosest culture, meaning weaker social norms and a lot more tolerance for deviant behavior or deviations from, from those norms. Um, looking here, it looks like Morocco is about as tight as it's going to get, right? So very strong social norms and very little um, tolerance for, for deviating from those norms. We got the U.S. down here at 58, so we're kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Um, compared to, say, our neighbors to the north, the Canadians, Canada, say 84. So, um, who else, who are we closest to? Looks like we're pretty close to Russia there, um, which is 57. So, you get the idea, right? Um, the U.S. tends to be somewhere, somewhere in the middle when it comes to tightness or, or looseness of our uh, culture. Okay, um, another important feature of a group is cohesiveness, right? So we have roles, we have norms, we have cohesiveness. So when we talk about cohesiveness, this is the extent to which forces push group members closer together such as through feelings of intimacy or unity and commitment to the group goals, right? So group cohesion is associated with better performance. Um, more cohesive groups tend to, to perform better. Um, it's not the only variable, though. Uh, there are other variables that are more important in predicting when and to what extent this type of cohesion co group cohesiveness and performance, this type of relationship um, or correlation between the two, um, will emerge. And we'll take a look at, at a couple of those in a moment here. Um, so yeah, group cohesiveness is important for performance, but sometimes in more situations than, than others, or some situations than others. Um, one example in terms of how cohesiveness uh, might be influenced by another factor is, again, culture, right? So cohesiveness can be affected in different ways as a function of quote-unquote collectivist versus individualistic um, cultures. So when we talk about collectivist cultures, remember um, collectivist cultures tend to, to value social harmony and cooperation and this interpersonal connectedness, right? Um, compared to individualistic cultures that tend to value more um, independence and more unique characteristics or unique contributions. How this might play out in terms of, say, a role um, in a, in a uh, group, or uh, not a role, in, uh, play out as cohesiveness in, um, in a group is that um, individualistic cultures might value group cohesiveness um, less so than collectivist types of cultures. 
also when it comes to culture, um, you know, it can influence how leaders are expected to behave in groups. Um, you know, certain cultures might have more of a, uh, a, a an expectation of of a strong directive leader, um, and some cultures might prefer, let's say, a leader who is more um, expressive, who is more emotive, who is there to to kind of guide the group in a certain direction, rather than say lead the group in in a certain uh, direction. Also, um, your culture can can help. Um, determine how comfortable the group is going to be when it faces conflict, right? And how these, uh, how the group is going to, to deal with this difficult, uh, debates, heated debates. Um, one thing that, you know, our country does very differently than, say, um, the UK, um, we'll take a look at Congress versus Parliament in the UK. Um, if if you ever, you know, if you haven't seen debates in, in the UK Parliament, just Google Google one. Um, check it out on YouTube. In the British Parliament, they are constantly fighting with each other, yelling at each other, screaming, um, calling each other names. All the other prime ministers are banging on the table and booing, and it, it's, a, it's a ruckus over there. Um, compared to, you know, watch C-SPAN, um, here, to take a look at our Congress and, you know, it's, it's all supposed to be very collegial and any type of insults, um, are very subtle, if at all, um, you know, if they're there at all, um, they're very subtle and you have to show all of this deference and, and all of this type of respect, um, almost to a fault, I think, because it looks Kind of phony, you know. Um, we know that that's not how people really talk or what people really think of each other. The the UK system is probably not good either, though. Um, but again, this is the um, an example of how culture um, might help set different expectations of how to deal with conflict or, or debate. Um, some cultures tolerate it or welcome it more, right? Okay, so how do the uh, the presence of other people affect our, our behavior or our performance, right? If we're working together in a group, um, how might it be different than how might we perform differently than if we were just you know working by ourselves? Well, um, this question is referring to a phenomenon known as social facilitation, and um, triplets. Early studies, these, these were done in the, the late 1800s. Um, he had a, a series of studies where he asked participants to wind up a fishing wheel. Right, so he would he was basically looking to for uh, doing doing reaction time types of studies, um, and he uh, he would have individuals reel up the fishing reel by themselves and time them. Um, then he would have you know, them do it together in pairs or, or in groups and time them. And what did he find? Well, he found that people tended to to wind up these reels faster when there was someone else there. So the presence of another individual improved performance on this task. Um, and this led to the, this idea, you know, of social facilitation um, that we'll, we'll see uh, it's a little bit more complicated, um, you know, according to Triplet, it was just the, the mere presence of another person, so just having another person there tended to improve behavior. What we've found now, um, or through later studies, is more of a mixed bag. Um, sometimes having a person there will improve performance, sometimes having another person there will worsen performance or won't have any effect on performance. So it could um, it could go either way essentially. Right? Uh, so the jhana solution that is essentially to trying to explain, you know, why do we see the presence of a person 
another person sometimes improves performance and sometimes you know, weakens performance. Well, according to this uh, model here, it's, it's actually a three-step process that's going that's going on. Um, so this three-step process for the influence of another person or the presence of another person. Um, first thing that happens, having this other person around, creates a general physiological arousal. So we feel, you know, our our heartbeat go up. Or you know you get a little bit of adrenaline um, in our bodies by having this other person around, which energizes our behavior. Um, the second step in this model is this um, physiological arousal tends to um, enhance our performance of the dominant response. What does that mean? Well, the dominant response is how we normally perform, right? So let's say if I'm a really good guitar player, which I'm, I'm not, let's uh, pretend that I am, um, my dominant response would be to play well. When someone, when I pick up a guitar, I should, should be able to play it, right? Um, so according to um, this three-step process, having someone around will produce a physiological arousal that will enhance my dominant response and result in a better performance, right? Um, if I'm a really bad guitar player, which I am, um, then having an audience is going to, again, having a, someone there produce this physiological arousal that's going to elicit my dominant response, which is to suck at playing the guitar, and it's going to result in a worse performance. Um, so actually, you know, as I'm doing this lecture right now, recording it, I'm talking to myself. This is not good, right? Um, my job, what I do, is talk to, to people, is to teach people. I, teaching is pretty performative. Um, I always find that I, I do much better when I have an audience, right? So my dominant response as a teacher, um, if I have people in front of me, is to be better, right? Why? Well, because hopefully um, you would agree that I'm at least not, not horrible um, at, at teaching, at talking. Um, so my dominant response is, is to do that. And having uh, a person there or people there produces a physiological arousal. I feel energized. I go and teach, and I result. It results in a much better performance than right now. Me talking to a dot, my web camera, right? Like tripping over my words here. Very un. Very not smooth, um, but. You do the best you can uh, with what you got, right? So essentially, um, the, the, the different steps work like this. Um, we first have the presence of another person or a member of the same species. We include that because um, studies with animals have shown that the social facilitation exists in other species as well. So if you have uh, you know, cockroaches run a uh, cockroach race, or a mouse, you know, run through through a maze. Um, it'll actually run through the maze faster if there's another mouse, um, or the cockroach will run through the little cockroach marathon um, route, or whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> They'll run across the table or run run uh, across the room faster if there's another cockroach there. So we have the mere presence of another person or another person of your, another member of your species, if you're a cockroach or a mouse watching this video. Um, this mere presence will elicit a increased uh, physiological arousal and that physiological arousal will strengthen your dominant response. If you find the task easy, 
then your performance will be enhanced. If you find the task difficult, then your performance will be weakened. Okay, so that's how we can explain um, social facilitation, right? Some other explanations that have uh, have come about. Um, well, again, we had the the initial explanation, the mere presence explanation, that says just the mere presence of other people is sufficient to produce this social facilitation. You don't need physiological arousal, right? Um, we're not sure about that one. Um, another explanation is that no, it's it's we're really just afraid of being evaluated, right? So it's not necessarily the the, the presence of another person. Um, it's just that we're we're afraid to be judged by that other person, right? So this is the evaluation apprehension um, explanation. So it's that the presence of others will produce social facilitation effects only when those other people um, are seen as potential evaluators. So let's say, you know, you, most people hate public speaking. So if you had to give um, a talk in front of a class, you know, your dominant response might to might be to not do so great. But according to, to the evaluation apprehension um, explanation, it says, yeah, you probably won't do so great in front of people who you think are capable of judging you, evaluating you. If you had to go give a talk to a bunch of kindergartners, then you probably it wouldn't have any effect. We wouldn't see any type of social facilitation effect. Unless, you know, you have a lot of anxiety about public speaking. But otherwise, um, hopefully you get you get my point here, is that um, it's only people who we, we feel are capable of, of judging us um, is when social facilitation will kick in, according to this explanation. And then finally, um, the distraction conflict explanation is a cognitive explanation. It's saying that, yeah, we could explain that social facilitation effect because the mere presence of other people acts as a distraction, right? Um, these other people are distracting us. Um, they're creating a what we would refer to as a an attentional conflict. Um, I know that they're there, right? So they're kind of like freaking me out. Like knowing that they're there, I can't really focus on what I'm doing. So like, you know, you're annoying me type of thing. Um, and I'm sure we, we've all felt that way, right? You know, hate when we know we're being looked at. Um, it's kind of really distracting. Um, the issue here is that it doesn't take into account why the presence of other people can help our performance or improve our performance, right? Okay, so if social facilitation is, you know, hopefully a way to, to help us perform better in group, well, then we can talk about the opposite in terms of um, slacking off in groups, also known as social loafing, right? So social loafing um, is a group produce reduction in individual output on easy tasks in which contributions are pooled. What does that mean? Well, for easy tasks where a lot of people are working on it, we're probably going to reduce our contribution to that task. We're going to slack off a bit, right? Well, not always a bit. Sometimes different situations will produce different levels of social uh, social loafing, but this is what we're what we're referring to. Um, so, as part of social loafing, specific performance of one individual cannot be easily determined within that pool effort, meaning you can't be identified as the one who's slacking off, right? Or it would be difficult to identify you as as slacking off. It's a pooled effort, so you, there's a little sense of anonymity in, in a sense, right? Um, that your individual contributions can't be singled out. So in such situations, 
our tendency as humans is to slack off, is to socially loaf, right? Um, so is this due to less individual effort or poor coordination of effort? No, well, good question. Um, here's one study here where um, experimenters asked um, this was a group of college students um, to cheer and clap their hands, right? And say as loud as you can. And this person, this right here, sound pressure per person. So they measured how loudly um, each individual would clap and how loudly they cheered. You can see when the was just one individual, just one student, um, they cheered really loudly and clapped pretty loudly. Once there were two people though, well now the students individually lowered their cheering and lowered their clapping, right? He added a, another two students, a double the size here, and they cheered even less loudly and clapped even less loudly, um, so on and so forth. So we're, we're seeing that as group sizes was increasing in this study, um, each individual was contributing less and less, right? Okay, so how can we reduce social loafing? How can we get people to, to kind of give it all they got all the time? Um, well, there are a number of different strategies. Um, that we, we can use. One is to limit the scope of the project, meaning break larger projects into smaller components. Um, it'll be harder to, you know, kind of get away with slacking off um, on a smaller, very specific task um, than, say, a larger, less specific task, but more broad task. Um, also, keep the group small. Um, smaller groups are are better in terms of holding for members to hold each individual member accountable. Once we start getting into larger groups, well, it's easier to get lost in those groups, um, and for your individual contribution to get lost in those groups as well. Um, use peer evaluations. This is a way again to to help keep um, each member accountable. Um, and make each group member a manager, quote unquote. Make them in charge of some different segment of the task. So I know if you're like me, you just really love group projects, right? Everyone tends to, to group projects tend to be universally hated um, by everyone um, for this reason, at least one of these reasons, the social welfare, right? Um, of course. There's just some classes like research methods two when um, students are going to do a, a project. Uh, you can't have 30 individual projects to, to help them manage. Um, it has to be done uh, as a group, as a team. And that's how the real world works. And then that's how science in the real world works. Uh, you work as, as groups, as, as research teams. Um, so one thing that I will typically do, well, I try to do all of these things. Um, try to keep the groups small, definitely have students evaluate each other, um, but also have, you know, particular students responsible for particular parts of the project or, say, the, the final paper. Um, I also highly encourage students who know each other or who have friends in the class um, to work together because it's a lot harder to, to, to slack off um, if you're going to be screwing over your friends, right? Um, they're probably not going to be really happy with you for that. So it'll lead to, to greater group cohesion. Um, okay, so when we talk about um, the individualistic effort or a collectivist effort, um, the collectivist effort model asserts that individuals will exert effort on a collective task when they think their efforts will help achieve outcomes that they personally care about, right? So essentially it's saying, yeah, people will, will exert um, 
effort for a collective task if they think they could personally benefit from it, right? So it's not really much of a, um, it's not really collective in that sense. It's still pretty selfish <laughs> in a way, even though we're, you know, we're engaging in a collective, a collective effort. Um, we're still hoping to get something out of it personally. Um, or people might increase their personal efforts on collective tasks to try to compensate for the anticipated social lo loafing or poor performance of other group members. Um, again, some of you who really hate um, group projects, might you might find yourself in this position. Um, is that, well, I'm going to put in extra effort now because I know, you know, I can't rely on these people to get the job done and our grade, all of our grades depend on it. Um, so according to this, this collective effort model, you'll, you'll put in the extra effort if you think you'll benefit from it. Social compensation model says, no, you'll put in extra effort uh, to help compensate for basically what you know is going to happen. Your other group members are going to start slacking off, right? Okay, so how does culture um, relate to, to social loafing? Oh, well, social loafing is a universal. Um, it's a universal human trait. Um, we can reliably find it across many cultures, many countries, many tasks. Um, pretty much any any task is susceptible to to social loafing. Um, there are some some group and cultural differences in tendency to social loaf, though. Um, it tends to be social loafing tends to be less prevalent among women than men even though women can still engage in social loafing, it just tends to be less prevalent. Um, and it also tends to be less prevalent in collectivist cultures than in individualistic cultures, right? So um, collectivist cultures, remember your sense of self, um, your self-concept is much more embedded in, in your group, um, in your group identities. So kind of slacking off in, in a group effort um, is kind of, kind of be hurting you more so than, say, somebody from an individualistic um, culture. It might have less of a, of a self-concept that is so um, strongly embedded within their group identity. Okay, so social loathing is when, you know, our individual contributions can't be readily identified, so we will just um, you know, put in less effort. Um, so again, there's a sense of this anonymity that that comes about, um, or that is a piece of social loafing. Um, taken to its extreme, though, anonymity can produce what's known as deindividuation. So deindividuation is the loss of a person's sense of individuality, and it also involves the reduction of normal constraints against deviant behavior. So when we become de-individuated, we basically become part of the mob, so to speak. Um, we lose a sense of ourself as an individual, and all those constraints that you know keep us from burning down a gas station or um, looting or or whatever. Um, all of those things that keep us from, from doing the, this type of deviant behaviors um, are gone, right? They're, they're gone with our sense of individuality. So some things that can contribute to de-individuation, well, number one, anonymity, we already spoke about. Um, once you kind of get lost in that crowd, you can't readily identify you or your, your behaviors. Um, this is more likely to, to lead to to a sense of de-individuation. Also, phys physical or psychological arousal. Um, so, you know, kind of being pumped up. All of these here that we're talking about um, are not good. These are why I don't do, you know, big types of uh, protests anymore. 
you know, when I was younger and stuff, I used to be, you know, much more involved. And then um, I learned about the individuation and say, like, wow, things could have gone really badly really quickly, right? Um, so physiological or psychological arousal, um, anonymity, um, reduced feelings of individual responsibility. So again, kind of going back to the, the Milgram studies, um, when the experimenter basically took all responsibility for, for whatever happened, you know, to that participant being shocked, don't worry, I'll take any blame. Um, so when you feel that you are not going to be held accountable um, or personally responsible, this could also lead to deindividuation. When there's lack of accountability cues or attentional cues, so when certain things are missing in your environment um, to remind you that you are you and you shouldn't do these types of bad things. Um, Right, so like say a good accountability cue would be uh, be seeing a whole line of police officers, um, and this is why you know police will often uh, come out in full force, even for very small and very peaceful um, you know protests. They're there to basically have a show of force um, and to remind you, right, uh, an attentional cue you know, keep you distracted, keep you, um, you know, interested in what they're doing instead of getting caught up into the mob, um, but also as an accountability cue. Say, hey, remember, um, there could be consequences for, for your behavior. Now, um, you know, just having a bunch of cops show up isn't necessarily uh, bad. Um, it just often leads to an escalation. Um, on both sides of, of, I don't want to say both sides necessarily, I don't know who, what the protest is about, but yeah, it could lead to an escalation of tension, let's just say. Okay, so this um, is, these are some results from a little study um, that was done on Halloween, right, and the Halloween candy. Um, so essentially um, what the researchers did was have Children come to their their home, um, you know, trick or treating, and they either had students come individually or in groups. And when the students did come, or the students, when the children um, did come to to the door, um, the researcher would ask half of the children what their names are and where do they live. So, hey, the cute costume, you know, what's your name? Where do you live, right? So. Basically, you know, these children had to identify themselves, right? Um, and then the other half of the, the children were allowed to remain anonymous. So they weren't asked what their names were or where they lived or anything like that. Um, then the researchers said, okay, you know, here's this bowl of candy. I'm going to put it here, you know, um, just take one piece, okay? And then I have to go take this phone call whatever kind of lie they told these kids. Um, so they left the kids with this bowl of candy and told them to just take one piece of candy, right? Here are the results, right? Percentage who took extra candy. So those who took more than they were supposed to. Well, when they were alone, when it was just a single student, uh, same student, and it's not college students. I was just talking to uh, a friend about mm -hmm. their kid, their kid in kindergarten. So that's where my head keeps going. Um, the individual kids would come up, and those who were not anonymous, right? They had to identify themselves. This purple here. Um, they were the least of all these combinations here. They were the the least likely to take extra candy. Um, when the stu the kids were alone, um, but they were anonymous, we see the percentage who took candy more than double in this case. Okay, here's where you know things get interesting, right? In a group, when they came up in a group, um, those who were not anonymous, so those who those um, children who had to identify themselves, 
only about 20% took extra candy. Those children who didn't have to identify themselves but who were in a group, almost 60% took extra candy, right? So, and we're just talking about extra candy from, from a bowl here. And we're already seeing this type of de-individuation happen. Um, being de-individualized in, within a group leads to, can lead to some really bad, bad things, right? And as demonstrated even just among a, a, a bunch of kids on Halloween and talking about candy. Um, so you can see how social unrest can happen really quickly and escalate um, out of control really quickly. Okay, so um, when we talk about um, losing our, our sense of self, um, uh, you know, are we adopting a, a, a new social identity? Um, what, what replaces that, that sense of self that, that's lost in the individuation? Well, the social identity model of the individuation um, effects says as um, personal identity and internal controls are submerged, are, are tapped down, um, social identity emerges and conformity to the group increases. So, yes, essentially, to, to my, my question, um, you know, what replaces that individual identity well this new group identity and what the 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 pressures to conform to the group and to go along with the group um starts to to increase right because this is that new identity that has replaced you that has replaced your sense of self so the consequences of losing your personal identity will depend on what you lose it to what kind of crowd are you in at that moment, right? Um, because that's likely what you're you're going to take on. Okay, so um, when it comes to going back here to, to group performance here, um, do groups always outperform individuals? And when and how are groups most likely to perform well? Well, let's look at each of those questions, right? So when we talk about um, group performance, there's this concept known as process loss. You know, process loss is the reduction in group performance due to obstacles created by group processes, such as problems of coordination and motivation. Right? So process loss is yeah, the reduction in your performance based on issues within the group or issues of, you know, between individuals in terms of motivation or coordination uh, within the group. When it comes to, um, let's say, performance in groups, it kind of depends on what, what kind of task it is that you're uh, performing. So um, when we, we talk about, you know, different tasks, there are additive tasks. Um, additive tasks are tasks in which each individual contributes something um, unique and some something important to that final outcome. Um, so something like, you know, a, a charity event, a fundraising event. Um, every person's contribution is going to, to matter in, in terms of reaching that, that end goal, meeting, uh, reaching the goal, right? Um, conjunctive tasks are tasks in which the weakest performer in the group is going to pretty much determine the outcome, right? So imagine if you're all you're going on a rock climbing expedition or you know hike Mount Everest or whatever. Um, you know whether you make it to the top of Mount Everest or whether you survive um, at all is really going to depend on the performance of your weakest member, right? In your your weakest performing member. Um, yeah, if they flip up or they start slacking off, well, you're, you could all die at this point. Um, and then there are disjunctive tasks 
and disjunctive tasks are um, tasks where the the strongest um, and I say strongest and, and weakest not in terms of physicality um, just in terms of performance right so you the the best performer um, the strongest performer of the group is going to determine the outcome um, so uh, the best example I could think of for a disjunctive task is um, you know if you were doing some type of game show and that you had you know the blue team and the red team and it was some type of quiz or trivia trivia night right the trivia game um, you know the you want the person who knows all of the who's really good at trivia um, because you know how well they perform is going to determine how well your group performs so you could you don't need to know anything really so long as you got someone who's really really good um, at, at trivia in your group Okay, so that's process loss. Um, that's a reduction in group performance and you know, could be a product of any of these types of tasks. Um, process gain is an increase in group performance so that the group outperforms even the best individual members. Means that your, your group is going to be able to perform or perform better or accomplish something that even the strongest um, performer within the group would not be able to do themselves or accomplish themselves. So one process that is involved in um, in groups all the time, right, um, coming up with ideas, brainstorming. So brainstorming is a technique that attempts to increase the production of creative ideas by encouraging group members to speak freely without criticizing their own or other people's contributions. So brainstorming is supposed to be like a word association type of process. It's whatever comes out, you know, no, no matter how silly it is, right? Just, just get it out there. Um, research shows that nominal groups produce a greater number of better ideas. Um, brainstorming can also increase group cohesiveness, so getting people talking and having and sharing ideas is a way to um, kind of bring people together, but overall brainwa brainwashing, <laughs> brainstorming in groups um, it doesn't work. It's not effective, um, usually speaking, right? So factors that reduce the effectiveness of, of group brainstorming. Um, one is production blocking, right? Having to wait your turn to speak often leads you to forget what it was you were going to talk about, right? And you're also, while you're waiting to talk, you're not sitting there generating new ideas. You're you know, trying to remember what it is you're you're saying or going to say when it's your turn. Um, so sometimes you, you might just lose interest, might just give up, right? So it's like forget it, whatever. Uh, it's gonna take me forever to before I get to say anything and forget it, right? Also, when you brainstorm in groups, um, you have social loafing, right? What we call free riding. So as others contribute ideas, individuals see their own contributions as less needed or less likely to have any type of impact. So they'll be less engaged. They'll start, you know, um, social loafing, um, evaluation apprehension. The whole point of brainstorming is to say whatever comes to your mind with no judgment. Yeah, right. I mean, we're we're humans, right? We're we're constantly, we're very judgy, number one, and if we're not judgy ourselves, we're certainly afraid uh, that other people are, are judgy and going to judge us. Um, so yeah, we might be hesitant to suggest some, you know, weird, far out their ideas because we don't want to look foolish or be criticized, right? Um, and we also have performance matching. So this is where group members will work only as hard as they see other group members working. Um, so basically you'll just start matching your performance to others. 
if other people aren't really into it, they're kind of slacking off, well, then you're likely to, to slack off um, as well. So brainstorming is typically better done individually, right? So brainstorm individually, then come back with your notes and compare them within a group. Um, doing so will, you know, reduce all of this stuff um, over here. But um, brainstorming electronically um, might actually be better in terms of group brainstorming. So if you're brainstorming, say, online in the chat room or something like that um, in real time electronically, um, might be actually beneficial. I mean, it could be effective. Why? Well, production blocking is reduced because members can type their ideas into the chat whenever the ideas come up, right? They don't have to wait their turn. Just type in real time on a message board, in a chat room, uh, wherever the case may, might be. Um, free writing is reduced by having the computer or having the, the group leader um, keep track of each member's output, so how many times they're contributing. Um, evaluation apprehension is reduced because we tend to feel more anonymous when we're online. Um, and you can actually set it up so that people are participating anonymously. So ideas are being generated without your name attached to it, right? Um, performance matching is reduced because group members spend less time focusing on the performance of others as they're typing in their own ideas. Um, so you're really focusing uh, more on what you're doing and less on what other people are doing. And group members can benefit by seeing the ideas of others, which can inspire new ideas um, that they might not have otherwise um, considered. Right? Um, so group brainstorming in person, probably not a good idea. Online, could work. Okay, so let's say we're in a group, we're brainstorming, or we're talking, we're trying to reach a decision. Um, there are a couple of things that can happen um, in terms of the outcome that we're going to reach. Um, one phenomenon that, that, that can occur is what's called group polarization. Um, so group polarization is the exaggeration of those initial tendencies um, in the thinking of group members through that group discussion. What does that mean? Well, if we enter a group discussion already having an idea of, you know, how what the outcome should look like or what kind of decision we should make um, then having that discussion is likely to make us even more extreme in in that decision right or make us more confident um, that that's the right decision so essentially group polarization is the process by which our initial kind of tendencies initial kind of feelings have now become really solidified. Have become, you know, we've become really confident in in these beliefs that we, you know, were just tendencies at first. Um, so, what are some possible explanations or causes of um, group polarization? Well, one is the persuasive arguments theory, so that you know people are going around the table talking about their initial um, beliefs or their initial tendencies and you know you, they're making persuasive arguments or just the number of times you're hearing that argument is persuasive in and of itself right even if they're not particularly strong or persuasive argument um, you're just hearing it a lot of times um, which will make you more um, persuaded or more confident that that's the right thing to do right um, also, there might be a comparison of the self to follow to fellow um, group members and to outgroup members. Um, in other words, am I part of this group? Well, they seem to be going in this direction, right? So, am I going in that direction too? Right? Yeah, I, I guess I am, right? 
Um, so this comparison of the self to fellow group members can be kind of thought of as, you know, maybe a form of conformity of sorts. So not just informational conformity, right? There might be some normative conformity going on as well. Okay, another uh, not good thing that can happen um, in group decision making is something called groupthink. So groupthink is a group decision making style that's character characterized by an excessive tendency among group members to seek concurrence, to seek agreement, right? So when groupthink happens, we're no longer, you know, concerned um, or as concerned about making the correct decision. Um, we're more concerned about making the agreed upon decision. And this has led to some, some major tragedies um, throughout history. The Challenger disaster, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, JFK, uh, he learned from that. He learned from that and avoided groupthink, and that's probably why we're all still here and didn't, you know, enter World War III during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we could think of um, groupthink as kind of a, a disease in a sense, right? So, what are some of the, the causes of groupthink? Well, having high cohesiveness, so having groups that are are really closely knit. Um, having a lot of cohesiveness gives people a sense, or a greater sense, um, to, to go along with the group, right? Um, depending on the group structure, the way that the, the group is structured can, can lead to group think. So having homogenous members, having, you know, a, a group of people who all already think alike, who come from the same backgrounds, who come from the same, you know, um, socioeconomic status, whatever the case may, may be. Um, so having a, a really tight-knit group of very similar people is, could be a problem here. Um, having that group in isolation, meaning, you know, we're going to go into this room and we're not leaving until we reach a decision. That's a horrible that's a horrible thing to do in terms of group decision making. Um, you don't want that group operating in isolation. You want that group to be consulting outside sources, right? If need be. Um, a directive leadership. So uh, one thing that a good group leader will do um, is not mention what they think until after everyone has spoken, right? Even then, maybe they don't need to, to mention what they think at all, right? Having a directive leadership or a directive leader who says, you know, I think we should do this. Um, well, yeah, you're the leader of the group, so now everyone's going to think that, that you should do, that they should do that, right? Um, so that's not, that's not good. Um, unsystematic procedures. So this is why if you're familiar with Robert's rules uh, of engagement of, of meetings, right, um, that's why well, one of the reasons of why Robert's rules exist. Um, they offer systematic procedures of, you know, who can talk and when um, you can talk and how to essentially reach decision in groups by voting, making motion, voting on them, so on and so forth. Um, so the absence of any type of systematic uh, procedures could, could get you into some trouble here. Um, also, stressful situations, right? Stressful situations that require a timely answer, timely solution, now, right? Well, that's going to put pressure on the group to start conforming, right? To start reaching a, a solution. So what are some of the symptoms? How do you know when you're, you're in group think? Well, the group will tend to be very confident in itself. Um, so we'll see this overestimation of the group. That they are pretty, pretty sure they are right, you know. Um, and that will often leads to closed-mindedness. So they'll start shutting down any type of 
um, dissent, essentially, right? Not open to any any other um, ideas or any alternative solution. Um, they're kind of set in in pursuing this path. Um, increased pressure towards uniformity. So again, people might feel the pressure not to rock the boat, not to you know go against the rest of the group, and that can lead to self censorship. So uh, you feel like you should say something, but I'm not going to say anything, right? I don't want to be that person, so to speak. Um, unfortunately, this gives the illusion of unanimity, right? Or this gives the illusion of that everyone agrees because nobody's speaking out against it. Um, another symptom, effective decision making. So there's an incomplete survey. Of the alternatives, you, you didn't go through all of you know possible alternatives. There's also an incomplete survey of objectives. You haven't really thought about what your your goals are and how you're going to reach those goals. Um, a failure to examine risks of your preferred choice. So, you know, okay, we're gonna go. Excuse me. We're going to go with this path, or we're going to go with um, this decision, but you fail to to really assess um, all the possible risks that are involved there. Also, failure failure to reappraise initially rejected rejected alternatives. So you didn't go back um, and revisit some ideas that that were tossed out earlier on. Um, what else do we have here? Selective bias in processing information at hand. Clearly, right? We engaging in confirmation bias, especially if we already see a decision in sight. We'll tend to, you know, ignore information that goes against um, that decision. And unfortunately, this often leads to us um, or the group failing to come up with a contingency plan. Well, what are you going to do if it goes if this doesn't work? What, what happens if you know it, it goes wrong? Well, the group is so confident in itself, um, the idea that it could possibly not work is inconceivable. And they certainly haven't planned for it, right? And what's the likely outcome of all of this? Well, it's a high probability of the group making a bad decision. So how can we prevent group think? Well, avoid isolation. Uh, groups should consult widely uh, with outsiders, um, with external forces. Also, reduce group pressure to conform. So leaders should explicitly encourage criticism and not take a strong stand early in the discussion. Um, you know, group leaders should listen um, at first and encourage people to say play devil's advocate. Or to express unpopular opinions, um, maybe even designate somebody. Said, okay, it's your job that no matter what the group says, it's your job to say the opposite. Right? Um, that's a good way to help reduce pressure to conform. Um, also, establish a strong norm of critical review. Um, so again, as a group leader, this is something that you can do have subgroups, um, break the group up into subgroups, and they should separately discuss the same issue, right? So that you're not just one whole group having the same conversation. You have a couple of groups having the same conversation that might come up with different ideas. Then you can reconvene um, and compare, you know, what, what was said in those individual groups. So you're doing, by doing so, you're establishing this this norm of of a critical review, this norm of you know questioning, and this norm of exploring alternatives. Um, also, use all the information and skills that are available to to the group. Um, if you have someone you know who's an expert on on something, bring that person in, bring them into the conversation, right? Um, also. To help avoid groupthink is to avoid bias sampling, right? And when we talk about bias sampling, this is the tendency for groups to spend more time 
discussing shared information, so stuff that we already know, right, or that most of us already know, um, we spend more time discussing that information than unshared information, meaning information that only one person or only a handful of people of the group know. Um, so definitely the group should be talking about that unshared information. Um, we spend most of our time talking about shit we already know, though, right? Um, so groups are going to be more susceptible than individuals to information sharing biases, again, because of the nature of groups and the nature of group decision making. It's not an easy process, and there's lots of uh, potential downfalls that, that we saw, particularly with group think, right? Um, one thing that groups do better than individuals um, is transactive memory. So what do we mean by transactive memory? Well, transactive memory is a shared system for remembering information that helps groups remember more information more efficiently than individuals could ever do. So um, the psychology department, this is a great example of transactive memory. So I don't need to know everything there is to know about psychology, right? It would be impossible for for me to know everything. Um, the department works as a group um, in the sense that we have people who specialize in cognitive psychology, people who specialize in developmental, in clinical, in social, so on and so forth, right? And we actually have multiple people who specialize in those different areas because they might have different takes on on each of those um, subfields. So we don't need professors who know everything about everything in psychology because the, that would be impossible. Um, you have a you have a department. You have this transactive memory that takes place, um, and it happens all the time that we we share information. Um, all the time between you know our specialties between our uh, the professors. Okay, so goals and plans in a group. Um, the do your best plan or goal is not as effective as establishing goals that are very specific. So having very clear goals that are challenging, right? But that are achievable. So do your best is not a good plan um, or a good goal, right? Um, set your goals to be specific, to be challenging, but doable, that you can achieve them. And group members can provide accountability and encouragement to, you know, keep trying, keep trying to, to reach this goal, to complete this task, whatever, um, or reach this, make this decision, whatever it is you're um, trying to do as a group. So absence, absence of a specific plan can result in failure to use expertise that is available to the group. If you don't have a specific plan, then you don't know what your objectives are. You don't know what resources um, you're going to need, right? So specific goals are, are important. Um, and we can see here, this is the results of a study taking a look at weight loss when it came to um, what well, looks like weight loss in kilograms um, uh, based on, say, these four different scenarios. So people who had no clear plan and they were going at it alone. So basically me just saying, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna lose some weight. Um, not sure how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it, right? Okay, so one kilo on average, which is what, about two and a half pounds or so? Um, I don't know <laughs> the metric system, right? Um, okay, then we have um, the second group here who had a plan and they were going, and they did it alone, right? So the specific plan was, well, I'm going to reduce my calories by X number a day and, you know, I'm going to do that by myself. And we could see they didn't really lose any significantly more than than the person who didn't have a plan, right? Um, then we we get into you know this other group here who had 
no plan, but they had a partner, right? So I'm going to lose some weight and I'm going to do it with my friend. Okay. They didn't really do much better either, right? Does that all look definitely not statistically significant? Any of those tiny little differences we see here. But the person who had a plan, a specific plan, and a partner, you could see almost three times, right? Over three times, um, the amount of weight loss by having a specific plan and having a partner, having that that support there uh, to do it. Okay, um, we don't need to worry about that. Um, tech teaching, technology type of stuff. Um, okay, so let's say conditions for, for team effectiveness. So what makes an effective team, essentially? Um, well, there are a couple of different conditions that you should focus on, that teams should, should focus on to, to maximize their effectiveness. Um, one, team should be interdependent for some common purpose and have some stability of membership. In other words, all the team members in there should have some common purpose of why, why they're there, why they're involved in the team. Um, and there should be some stability in in the team. There's some should be some people who who've been there, you know, longer than others. Um, this is why you you tend to kind of stagger the position uh, of group membership so that there's always some people who who've been there uh, for a while before. Okay, the team's overall purpose should be challenging, clear, and consequential. Meaning the team should be engaged in something challenging to keep them interested, um, to emphasize the importance of what it is they're, they're engaging in. Um, the purpose should be very clear. This is what your, your job is, your role is, this is what the purpose of your group's existence is, um, and it should be meaningful. It should be consequential in some way. Um, also, teams should be as small as possible and have clear norms that specify what behaviors are valued and which are unacceptable. So again, smaller groups tend to be more effective um, at not only group cohesion, um, but also reducing social loathing and also reducing group think, right? Um, a, or pressure to conform, rather. So also having a reward system so a reward system should provide positive consequences for excellent team performance. So basically encourage good behavior, discourage bad behavior. Um, and technical assistance and training should be made available to, to the team and to individual team members. Um, so different conditions to, to help um, increase group effectiveness. So how can we support or how could we try to avoid um, group thing? Well, allow group members to raise their concerns anonymously. Um, if we're doing this online, it could be through you know some some kind of survey system or some type of um, discussion board that people can post concerns um, without their name or any information attached to it. Also, um, reduce the directive role of the leader. Right. And if you find yourself the leader of a group um, or a group discussion, you know, try to take less of a directive role. Um, should be doing more listening um, and more type of facilitating than than actually directing or leading the group, so to speak. Um, number three, enable group members to provide input simultaneously so they don't have to wait for a chance to raise their ideas, right? Again, that can be more easily done um, online through a computer type of discussion. Um, number four, allow the least assertive group members to state their ideas as easily um, as the most dominating. So there's always going to be you know, some people who dominate the conversation more than others. Um, that's normal, right? Um, so it's important to allow those people who 
who don't talk as much or who are not as as assertive um, to allow them to have an equal opportunity, an equal you know footing, so to speak, um, to express their ideas as well. Uh, number five, provide a systematic agenda of information gathering and decision making. So basically, have a plan, have a plan that has different objectives and different resources that are needed to reach a, each objective. Um, you know the desired outcome so on and so forth. The more specific, the better. Um, number six, keep the focus in the group meetings on the ideas themselves rather than on the people um, or the relationships of the people that are in that group, right? So again, the discussion should always be on the idea. Don't attack the person or pull rank on them, you know, like I, I have a degree in such and such. Nobody cares, right? We're trying to discuss the ideas. So if your idea is better, that's fine. Um, but throwing credentials or personal attacks around um, isn't really good. Okay, so in terms of virtual teams, I've been you know tossing in um, information about online group decision making. Um, when it comes to the virtual groups, uh, they could be more vulnerable to some factors um, that harm traditional groups. One is that virtual teams tend to have less cohesiveness, right? There's a lot less intera direct interaction that happens um, in virtual groups and virtual teams. And this can inhibit cohesiveness, so you kind of lose that tightness um, in the group, as you probably experience now, taking an online class versus taking an in-person class. Less interaction, there's less of a cohesiveness there. Also, uh, virtual teams may have difficulty in socializing new members. Um, and also keeping roles or sharing information and developing these types of transactive um, memory systems. A lot of these, say, you know, keeping roles and sharing information, a lot of this stuff happens through interactions. And when you have limited interactions, then these important components of, of making a good group uh, become even more difficult. Um, okay, so culture and diversity. So culture and diversity as it relates to groups, uh, groups are becoming increasingly diverse and evidence on the effects of diversity on group performance uh, is mixed. So the, on one hand, there's the increased potential for miscommunications and misunderstandings um, when you have more of a diverse a group, so you know, more diversity opens the, the uh, possibility for um, misunderstandings, and that can cause frustration and resentment among group members, and that could, you know, not could, will likely um, damage group performance. Um, but it could have a positive um, pattern in terms of, or it can result in positive patterns of socialization. Um, certainly creativity, right? Um, and of course, the complexity and inclusiveness of group ideas and group discussions. Um, so diversity for diversity's sake probably is going to end in a weaker group uh, performance um, because of potential miscommunications, misunderstandings. Um, but Diversity for the sake of improving the group's outcome, um, having people of different backgrounds, of different um, opinions, of different lived experiences can all result in, in a much more informed um, and inclusive decision making process and outcome in the end. Um, so recent research focuses on understanding specific factors that can um, help groups achieve the benefit of diversity. Um, and by and large, again, um, diversity of ideas is important as well, in, particularly in trying to avoid um, group think, right? Okay, so when we talk about collective intelligence, 
let's just say the intelligence of the group you know how how well are they going to perform how well um, how much knowledge uh, do they have well some predictors of collective intelligence um, involve the average social sensitivity of the group members so overall how socially sensitive are are the members of the group um, also the tendency to allow for sorry had a little glitch there um, okay so where were we here um, so having a higher proportion of women in the group um, and women tend to be higher than men in terms of social sensitivity um, this is a predictor of collective intelligence uh, of the group. What's not a predictor of collective intelligence is the average or maximum level of intelligence of the individual uh, members of the group. Um, and trust me, uh, I sit on plenty of groups at the college that are made up of extremely highly educated people, uh, people with PhDs, and yeah, this, uh, some of the stupidest uh, conversations I've ever had in my life are in some of those groups, right? Um, so collective intelligence and individual intelligence are are very different things. Um, okay, so conflict. What happens when things don't go so great or when we run into a snag here? Um, what kind of dilemmas do groups often uh, confront? Um, what factors influence whether individuals and groups will act cooperatively or competitively um, when dealing with those dilemmas? And how can negotiation be used to help solve group conflicts? Well, let's answer some of these questions here. So when we talk about a social dilemma, this is a situation in which a self-interested choice by everyone will create the worst outcome for everyone. So essentially in the pursuit of self-interest um, we produce we produce self-destruction. So the prisoner's dilemma is a classic example of one of these social dilemmas. In the prisoner's dilemma this is a type of dilemma in which one party um, must make either a cooperative or competitive move in relationship to the other party. Right? So uh, the dilemma is typically designed so that the competitive move appears to be in one's self-interest. Um, but if both parties make this move, then they're both going to suffer more than if they had cooperated. So this is how it would work, right? Let's say prisoner A and prisoner B both committed a crime. Um, if neither one confesses so prisoner A doesn't confess prisoner B doesn't confess they'll each get one year one year in, in prison or jail right if prisoner A confesses or doesn't confess sorry prisoner A doesn't confess but prisoner B confesses they they rat out prisoner A right well prisoner B doesn't go to jail so they get no time for confessing, and prisoner A gets 10 years in prison, right? Okay, let's see what happens with if prisoner A makes that same choice and tries to sell out prisoner B. Um, here, prisoner A, if they confess and prisoner B doesn't confess, well, then prisoner A gets no time in prison and prisoner B gets 10 years. But what happens if they both try to sell each other out? If they both rat on each other, well, they both get five years, right? So prisoner A confesses, prisoner B confesses, they both spend five years in prison. Where if they had just cooperated, kept their mouth shut, right, they would have only had one year in prison. So this is a classic example where, you know, we, were, we would be inclined, we might feel like, hey, we should probably confess because I don't want to spend any time in jail. But the other person is thinking the same thing, right? So if you both act in your own self-interest, you actually end up hurting yourself. You're going to get five years instead of just taking the one. Um, 
Okay, so when we talk about resource dilemmas, uh, these are social dilemmas involving how two or more people will will share a limited resource. And um, there are a couple, you know, well, it's not a couple, it's just an endless number of dilemmas that we're faced with. Um, but they basically fall into two two categories called the commons dilemma and the public goods dilemma. So the commons dilemma is when the outcome for any individual depends on the decisions of all of the people um, who are involved, right? So the outcome for any individual depends on on what the group is going to is going to do. Um, an example of this in recent years, I'm not sure if it's still going on. Now, um, the the drought in California, and um, there was a ban on watering um, your lawn um, in California a couple years ago. Again, I'm not sure if it's still um, going on because water was limited resource at this point. Um, now, in order for you to have drinking water, you need everybody to to stop watering their lawns to start conserving water. Um, but what we found, or what we saw, is that you know some people, rich Hollywood types, uh, still watering their lawns, massive green lawns in the middle of a drought. Um, so this is when you know a few people acting in their own self-interest. Can you know if we all did that, then we if everyone watered their lawns. There would be no water for people to drink, right? Um, something similar, not necessarily a resource dilemma, but you know why don't we just throw garbage on the ground, right? We we have a norm not to do that. Why? Well, because can you imagine if we all did that? If everyone just tossed their garbage on the ground, we'd all be living in the land still, right? Um, so when it comes to these commons dilemma, it's, uh, or these commons dilemma, it, um, you know, if everyone acted that way, we, in their own self-interest, um, we'd all be screwed, essentially. Um, public goods dilemma, kind of the opposite of that. Um, this is where we can all benefit from, you know, a few people sacrificing something or giving something to the group right so um, yeah well I think you know public libraries and public schools are kind of an example uh, of this um, property taxes go to schools um, so people who own property you know are giving money in taxes um, to schools that benefit all of us it's in everyone's interest whether you think so or not trust me it's within everyone's interest to have an educated populace to have an educated population um, so yeah property owners will will pay this extra um, money in, in taxes to fund something that will will go on to benefit everyone okay so responding to social dilemmas, um, you know, how do we, what decision do we make essentially? Um, well, part of us might have this fear of being exploited. Um, so fear of being exploited and, and greed are really important factors um, in determining how people react to social dilemmas. Um, I just learned today that Elon Musk is worth $250 billion. $250 billion, right? Whatever you think of that is cool. Um, but if he decided to give even half of that away, <laughs> um, he could make unbelievable type of good in this country right in society um, I don't think he's afraid of being exploited so that kind of leads to another option up there I'm not a fan of Elon Musk if, if you haven't noticed 
Um, but what factors will promote cooperation? Well, um, when it comes to psychological factors, um, having a pro-social cooperative orientation, right? So kind of just, again, we don't like using the word personality, uh, but yeah, having more of a pro-social, you know, we, we're all in this together type of mentality um, will help facilitate cooperation. Um, and also having trust in other people, that uh, thinking that most people are inherently good, that they're not out to, to exploit you, let's say. Um, some situa situational factors, um, being in a good mood. We've seen being in a good mood gets us to comply, gets us to go along with or fulfill requests. We're going to see that being in good mood is related to um, helping behavior as well. Um, having had successful experience managing resources and working cooperatively, so having past positive experiences with cooperation is good in determining if you're going to continue to be cooperative. Um, being exposed to unselfish models, so having good role models who, who act in unselfish ways. Um, having reason to expect others to cooperate. Um, so again, maybe relying on the norm of reciprocity there. So we expect other people to cooperate, I will as well. Um, in terms of group dynamics, acting as an individual rather than in a group. Um, we saw that groups can cause us to, to think in not so cooperative type of ways, right? Um, being in a small group rather than a large group, if you have to be in a group. Um, sharing a social identity or sharing common goals that will benefit um, you and the person who you know, you're know you trying to cooperate with. Um, and some structural arrangements that might help uh, play factor in whether people will cooperate or not. Um, creating a payoff structure that rewards cooperative behavior and or punishes um, selfish behavior. Or removing resources from the public domain um, and handing them over to private ownership. Um, let's see, establishing an authority to control the resources. I don't know about those last two, but yeah, these could be different structural arrangements that um, might facilitate in cooperation. Okay, so when we talk about cooperation, um, a component of that is negotiation, right? Um, and negotiation uh, is a way to, to resolve a, a disagreement that hopefully both parties are going to find you know, mutually acceptable. Um, so a negotiated resolution to a conflict, um, you know, so this is an integrative agreement, so a negotiated resolution to a conflict in which all parties obtain outcomes that are superior to what they would have obtained from an equal division of the contested uh, resources. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's relying on the um, norm or the concept of equity instead of equality, right? So if say you know you're part of a partnership that that dissolves that breaks up um you could split everything in the middle 50 50 figuratively or literally right okay you get half the couch and i get half the couch what the hell are you going to do with half a couch right why don't you take the couch and i'll take the chair or something like that right um this is an agreement that benefits us better than if we literally just chop the, the couch in two. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be literal. It could mean figuratively splitting things up 50-50, um, say making something completely um, equal is not always equitable, right? Um, okay, so when we talk about negotiations and, and how, how does it work, um, well, again, it depends on the, the culture that you're in. Um, some cultures are 
have expectations for negotiation and for bartering, essentially, right? Um, more Western cultures, especially like the United States, we tend to be really not interested or not good at negotiating. Kind of makes us feel uncomfortable, that type of back and forth. Um, but in many places around the world, this is expected. You're expected to negotiate, right? You go to a market and they try to charge you some ridiculous price. Um, you know, Westerners like us, we will probably pay it because we don't know that we're supposed to negotiate them way down, right? It's almost part of a, um, not a game, it's a social script, it's a social role uh, exchange that they're engaging in, this art of negotiation here. Um, so there are a couple of social or cultural um, assumptions here that are related to um, nego negotiation, right? So assumptions of negotiators from countries like the United States and other Western cultures uh, compared to, say, so assumptions from negotiators from non Western cultures, and you could look at these, I'm just trying to wrap this up before my memory um, is built up on my computer, I'm getting a little warning thing here, um, so you could pause this and, and read the different assumptions that negotiators are coming from in these two different um, cultures, Western versus um, non-Western cultures, or more individualistic, collectivist type of cultures, often the case, not always. Um, but yeah, finding common ground, how do you do it? Well, one thing to do is to find a subordinate um, identity or a subordinate goal. So try to find um, something that is going to be mutually beneficial, that you can both agree on. That could be an outcome, that could be an idea that you both value, whatever the case may be. Um, so this, you can think of this as a shared identity across group boundaries, um, increases attractiveness of outgroup members and often results in more peaceful um, type of interactions. So looking for commonalities, essentially, um, is not only good in helping you reach a, a decision that's going to, to benefit both uh, people, but also result in just more peaceful interactions, more peaceful being, more peaceful society, so to speak. Um, so for those who desire peace, finding common ground is in one's self-interest, right? So if you want to live in a peaceful world and finding, you know, what, what connects you with other people, what you have in common with other people, um, you're actually acting within your own self-interest, right? Um, but we'll save that for uh, another chapter when we talk about helping behaviors. Because um, some helping might be, say, selfish, right? And some helping is selfless. But we'll talk about that next time. Okay, take care all.